All right, so uh, here we go. Uh, today's talk is a Freakonomic take on open standards and Jakarta E. Uh, so this is not a technical talk, but it's actually one of the talks that's uh, really, truly near and dear to my heart. Um, I believe this is actually, if there's one talk I could give, uh, this is a talk that I believe I can uh, uniquely provide the most amount of value. So this is not a talk about uh, how you can use the technology in your day job or how to use uh, a specific aspect of it. Uh, but rather, this is a talk of more holistically uh, about uh, this technology from a different perspective. In, in this particular case, a Freakonomic perspective. And I'll explain in a second uh, why that is. But uh, in short, I'm really glad that uh, the Eclipse Foundation and uh, the Tech Talk series decided to have uh, this talk and saw value in it. So that other funny word uh, in the title, Freakonomics, uh, what is, is, is that about? Uh, so this goes back a little bit to my own uh, background. Uh, so to give you a bit of bit of uh, background on me, uh, you know, I didn't actually start in this field as a computer scientist. I, I started in this field uh, back in my freshman year as an economist. So computer science was was a sort of a side hobby of mine at that point in time, uh, and I still do retain a, a uh, interest in uh, in economics. Certainly, I I uh, look at, I listen to these. Two authors. Uh, this is an old book. It's a it's a New York Times bestseller by now, uh, and the authors actually have a podcast. Uh, it's a very interesting podcast. I'll tell you a little bit about the book and what this book is about if you don't know what it is. Uh, but basically, uh, what this book is about and what these uh, what these authors are about uh, is the fact that economics is actually not about all about dollars and cents. It's it's not all about uh, you know, macroeconomic GDP and inflation rates and so on and so forth. Uh, at the end of the day, economics is actually about understanding human behavior and what motivates people and what motivates markets uh, and taking an analytical and data-driven approach uh, to understanding the world. So this book in Freakonomics, uh, it takes a look at um, many different aspects that you wouldn't think of. So things like uh, abortion and population rates uh, and uh, uh, things like drug dealers, why some, some people decide to be drug dealers, uh, what is the effect of, a, of uh, naming a child a certain way and you know, uh, can that predict their future and so on. So it's a, it's a very interesting book. And uh, what this book, uh, when I read it, uh, made me realize is that I'm actually looking at uh, our particular field, uh, server-side Java, through Freakonomic eyes. And uh, this is really the reason, the fundamental reason why I am involved uh, in things like Java EE and Jakarta EE. Uh, and I thought, you know, uh, after this realization, I need to share this realization uh, with whoever I, whoever I can. Because even if they're not an economist, they may understand uh, why I'm looking at these things the way I am. And it's perhaps important for them to, uh, to realize this as well. So that's a bit about Freakonomics and, and what this talk is about. It's about taking a look at open standards and Jakarta E uh, from an economic standpoint, in, in short, an analytical uh, market space uh, standpoint. So believe it or not, standards are everywhere, right? So uh, it's not just about uh, us uh, in, in terms of programming and technology. We need to, uh, we tend to be very, very heavily driven by standards. So wherever you look, there's a, there's a, 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 always a standard behind it. But in fact, even if you look at your day-to-day -day job uh, or day-to-day -day life, uh, what you'll realize very quickly is behind almost everything in the modern world, there is a standard behind it. Everything that's manufactured, everything that you use uh, is usually backed by some kind of standard standards and some kind of standards body. So there's a reason why this is, uh, and, and this is why uh, fundamentally why standards are important for us uh, in the Java world as well. And in particular, there's from an economic standpoint, there's one particular reason that is the most important one, uh, and that is the one that we will uh, focus a little bit of our time uh, understanding today. But let's take a look at uh, the reasons from a holistic standpoint, uh, just so we all are sort of on the same page before we take our journey into uh, understanding um, our uh, Jakarta E and open standards from an economic standpoint. Uh, so the first is interoperability. Uh, standards give us an interoperability, meaning that uh, if there's a producer and a manufacturer of two different things, uh, they can't always meet uh, on a one-to-one -one basis to agree upon how their uh, uh, th two things can work 
uh, together with each other. So the best way of guaranteeing this is having an interoperability standard to say, hey, this is given a type of uh, producer and supplier, this is how they interact with each other. And that applies to software as well. In order to work for two bits of software to work with each other, uh, you need standards. Uh, standards are good for portability and compatibility. So this is more along the lines of uh, somebody that needs to depend on something else. In, in, in our terms, let's say we are application developers and we depend on something to run our application on. So uh, what standards allow you to do in this case, it, it gives you a base minimum set of things that you can rely upon. Uh, and the end result is that you can move your thing from one place to the other. And that's what compatibility and portability at the end of the day gives you. Application servers are a very good example of that. You can basically make some small changes to your application, but be able to move from one application server to other, another, uh, one vendor to another. Uh, standards provide a baseline quality of service, right? So if, if nobody guarantees what the quality of service is, you won't know what you can depend on. Uh, this is especially important uh, for things like uh, food, food safety, uh, uh, transportation safety. You need those those types of standards to be in place for those reasons. Um, uh, standards provide a core, uh, stable core for broad ecosystems. So when you have something that is very, very important that a bunch of people rely upon, uh, you need that thing to be uh, predictable and well understood. Right. So if that is, that thing is, uh, let's say, controlled by a monopoly or or defined in a proprietary fashion, that's a very high risk ecosystem because if anything changes in that thing that so many people depend upon, well, guess what? We're all going to be negatively impacted by those changes. So that's why another reason why you need uh, uh, open standards to define that core, stable core, reliable core for a very, very broad ecosystem. Uh, you need to maximize vendor and implementation neutrality, minimize lock and risks. So if you're a business person, you will well understand this, right? So if you're spending a whole bunch of money uh, on a vendor, you don't want to be so tied to that vendor that if something happens to that vendor or if that vendor decides to be not so good, there's no way for you to get out of it, right? So the standards provides you that that um, vendor neutrality and uh, a, a risk mitigation from lock -in. Uh, and standards uh, 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 reduce unnecessary fragmentation, right? So this is a, a, an interesting, you can also have an entire talk on, on this particular topic, but there's a question of when is choices too many, right? So th there, is a, there is a point in time where there's a point of diminishing returns of having too many choices. Uh, uh, cho too many choices simply just add to hyper competition and noise rather than actual customer value. So there is a there is a point in time, especially for things that are very commonplace, very very uh, foundational, that you don't actually want that much choice. You just want to know, okay, this is a thing I I want I want to use and I want to go with it, uh, and that's where open standards come into play as well. And we'll talk more about this. This is a this is a point that's correlated with the healthy competitive ecosystems uh, point as as well. Uh, so in some cases, as a consumer, you are actually want to deliberately limit your set of choices to a set of things that are standards and interoperable uh, and supported by multiple parties. And finally, this is a point that we'll talk about uh, a bit more uh, in depth today. Mo majority of this talk is going to be uh, dedicated to exploring this topic. Uh, standards uh, play an important role uh, in maintaining healthy competitive ecosystems under certain circumstances. There are certain circumstances where uh, really without standards, uh, you wind up with a uh, with a very, very bad market outcome. Uh, and that's what, 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 what we're going to talk about. And that's the idea that we'll explore more about today. And that's the fundamental reason why things like open standards and specifically Jakarta E uh, is so important to us. Okay. so. Some of you might be surprised about the fact that uh, uh, that I'm talking about this topic at all. And you might be wondering, is this something I'm making up? Uh, well, I'm not, right? So uh, the reality is uh, this is uh, standards. And the reason for standardization uh, is actually well established uh, in, the economic, in the economics domain. A lot of economists spend their lives 
uh, things that I'm, I'm, uh, I found very curious years ago is that the ISO. ISO, I don't know if you guys know what that is. It's the International Standards Organization. It's, it's one of the, uh, it's like the UN, it's a multinational uh, organization that plays a very important part in, in our world. It actually has to do with things like food safety and transportation safety. Uh, and they've actually bothered documenting and, and they sponsor economists to study this very topic that we'll talk about today. So if you if you have a bit of time, uh, take a look at these resources. Uh, some of them might seem a little bit, uh, uh, let's say, obscure to you if you, if you don't if you don't have an economic background. But uh, it might also be interesting to take a look at this uh, just to understand that we don't operate in a vacuum. So we are interconnected with a whole bunch of things that are not necessarily about writing code. All right, so. In order to understand any of this, uh, there's a simple concept that you actually need to understand. This is a simple concept that I found fascinating in, in my underground, uh, in my undergraduate years. Uh, this has uh, been around. This is a theory that's been around for a long time. It's been around uh, essentially since the since the 1930s, right? Right after the depression, people got to understand um, uh, this interesting phenomena, uh, and it allows us uh, to sort of understand our world a bit better. So this is something called the network effect. So let's spend a little bit of time understanding this network effect. So as you can see on my screen here, I have a picture of a, a bunch of uh, telephones. So you can uh, understand where this theory actually comes from. It, uh, it comes directly from, uh, believe it or not, the inventor okay, of, uh, of, of telephones, some guy that actually lived very close to where I live today. Um, and this is where the observation came from. So let's assume uh, in, in, uh, that you have these three different phone networks. OK, so uh, one phone network is uh, something that you, you and your uh, brother-in-law came up with, and you have a line from his house to yours. Uh, and you guys can call each other. But that's about it. That's, that's, that what's limit, that's what uh, limits your uh, network, OK? Uh, let's say there's a slightly bigger network. Let's say a network of farmers that decided to keep put up their own poles and ran phone lines uh, from uh, their house to another. And these there's these five uh, families that can call each other, uh, and and that's it. That's that's the that's their phone network. And now let's imagine a much bigger one, a much bigger tele uh, uh, a telephone network, but maybe managed by the town or managed by the city. Right. So if you are a new guy coming in and you are evaluating these three networks, which one would you pick? Uh, obviously, you would pick the one uh, that has that gives you the most value uh, and the, it's the most the most useful one to join, especially if you're paying some money to be part of this network. So you would pick the biggest network. Uh, but once you take this argument uh, to its logical extreme, what you realize is that what this means is that it, it this is tending towards monopoly power. So the bigger the, your market share, the more likely you will succeed in this scenario. Uh, if you have a bigger company and a smaller company, eventually the bigger company will get more and more business and the smaller company will get smaller and smaller business and eventually go away because they won't necessarily be competitive anymore. So this is a situation where this is a natural monopoly. The, the dynamics of the market, the dynamics of the thing that you are dealing with lends itself to, to becoming a, a monopoly. So telephones, uh, a, a telephone network uh, is very, very uh, prone to this and, and something like this, something that de uh, depends that, that more value is added by one more person adopting the thing. Right? If this dynamic exists and it exists very much in software, things like infrastructure, software in particular, you have this thing called network effect. So when you have network effect, uh, what happens is there's two different market outcomes. There's only, only two things that can happen once you have recognized that the thing that you, that you are dealing with uh, has this tendency of having a network effect. You can either wind up with a de facto standard or you can wind up with an open standard. Now, if you don't know what these words mean, uh, it, they may seem relatively harmless. Okay, yeah, they're both standards and you know standards are, are a good thing. The only different word here is de facto versus uh, open, well, what's the big deal, right? As long as I have a standard, uh, it's isn't it the same thing? Uh, 
Uh, well, it's really not. Uh, and this is where uh, our friends at uh, ISO really help us out. And uh, and they do, a, they do a body of work to understand what the difference between a de facto standard uh, and what's called a de jure standard. So de jure or, or open standards or uh, standards via, via FIAT, these are the same, same things. They're basically open standards, uh, is really all about. So in fact, this is a, uh, uh, a deck. This is a slide deck within a slide deck. This is a deck that is part of a workshop, training workshop ran by, run by the ISO, where it explains what the difference between a de facto standard is and a de jure standard is. So a de facto standard uh, reflects a market situation. Uh, so it, this is a situation where uh, there is a network effect in place. Uh, and the network effect has gone on for such a long period of time that there is just one thing that defines that market. If you want to use that particular functionality, you want to use that bit of infrastructure, there is really only one player that you would seriously consider. Uh, so that is what, what a de facto standard really is. It's a de facto meaning those are the facts of the of the market. Right? That's it's a not anything that anything can engineer anyone can engineer. It just happens by way of market uh, place evolution, especially when you have these uh, network effects in place. Uh, the good features about them is yes, they do provide standards. So they provide some of the benefits that we talked about uh, of, of, for the reasons for having standards of obviously the big one that it does not provide at all uh, is this healthy marketplace uh, marketplace situation. In, in the end, what happens is there's just one uh, dominant player and they control uh, that market. It's, a, it's a effectively a monopoly. Uh, the, it, at the end of the day, we'll talk a little bit more uh, in, in subsequent slides as to why monopolies, monopoly-like situations are so worrisome why should why should we uh, treat it with a great great deal of uh, great deal of concern uh, but the main thing one ones are lack of transparency the decisions are are not necessarily driven by customers they're driven by the interests of the monopoly rather than the interest of the of, of the consumer uh, and uh, by by virtue of uh, the monopoly, the monopolist can do various things, but that ultimately co goes down to limiting information, limiting flex market flexibility. Now, de jure standards, on the other hand, uh, is the opposite. So this is where the market basically recognizes that there is a network effect. Uh, and the way to uh, to counteract this network effect is for all people to agree on not producing the same thing, but producing the things uh, that basically conform to a an agreed upon uh, level of service. So, to a consumer, uh, for for all intents and purposes, it looks very much the same. Okay, uh, but in fact, these are different things. These are different implementations, different different products that come from uh, different providers. Uh, what the, the heart of open standards are is this word transparency. And we'll talk more about uh, in, in this slide, the words that are highlighted, transparency, openness, and consensus. We'll talk more about these. These are very important concepts in understanding uh, the value of Jakarta E and understanding the value of open standards. But the heart of any open standards is actually due process, right? You, you need to have a well-documented process that everybody can participate in an open way. All the decisions and all of the relevant information need to be transparent, right, so that uh, both the suppliers and the consumers can can participate in in that in the process in a transparent fashion. You need to have openness. Anyone that wishes to join can should be able to join this, even if it's a consumer, a new producer, what have you. Uh, and you need to have consensus, right? That's the heart of it. You have to agree upon the thing that you are going to all produce and consume. So uh, consensus is, is a very, very important. Um, now, consensus is a funny word. I'll, 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 uh, it's been coming up a little bit. I've seen, I'm seeing it a little bit, a misunderstanding of this term, especially in, uh, in some of the Jakarta ecosystem conversations. Consensus does not mean that, you, that you, we all agree. And, you know, it's just a, Nirvana, where you know we're we're all friends and we love each other and we all we all say yes to each other's propositions. It it actually means quite the opposite. It means agreeing to disagree, right? Or or another way another way to put this is disagree and commit. So it's the idea that uh, 
because you are part of this ecosystem, because you are part of this market, you may have your own ideas, right? uh, but you you have to agree with uh, the consensus process, right? And once whatever the consensus process uh, is reached, you have two options. You can either exit the market or you simply say, okay, I disagree, but I'm going to be part of this ecosystem anyway. So uh, open standards, we'll talk more about this also, but some of the disadvantages are uh, it, it can be lo longer, right? So if you're just a monopolist, you can just make whatever decision you like, it's very quick. Uh, or if you're near monopolist, same, same thing. Uh, it takes time to reach consensus. It, times, it takes time to document consensus. Uh, the, of course, there's always a risk of somebody saying, hey, I'm not part of this, but I want to be part of this market uh, and sort of engage in disruptive behavior and try to become a de facto standard to replace an open standard. So these are the risks, uh, un well understood risks of open standards. Uh, by the way, Tanya, so I, I, I forgot to mention this. So I, I do definitely want this uh, uh, talk to be conversational. So if anyone has a question or concern or a comment, uh, they should feel free to express that right away and feel free to just interrupt me right uh, uh, right in the middle of the talk and let's discuss that particular point instead of just uh, moving forward uh, are you still there Thanks, Reda. yeah absolutely i'm still here okay perfect uh, hopefully i'm not boring you to death not at all okay great all right <laughs> all right so uh there are actually some some real world examples of this occurring this is not just a construct in fact it's quite the opposite uh, uh, after the Great Depression, uh, economists uh, actually came to understood these dyna market dynamics and came to under came to figure out what the solutions to these problems actually are. So there's actually three uh, uh, different companies that uh, are landmark cases where economists needed to figure out: okay, this is what's happening. How do we figure out what the solution is? And the solutions are open standards. So these examples are AT&T. Uh, again, uh, if you look it up, this is basically the, the, the canonical example of what happens when you, there's uh, a network effect and the network effect translates to a monopoly. Uh, and you'll look, if you're interested, you should look into the roots of where AT&T started and why AT&T was almost destined to become a monopoly from day one. Um, Standard Oil Company is another example, and United States Steel. These are all uh, another example. So the other thing you will uh, notice is these are all American companies. Right? So there is something inherent about the American uh, system uh, and way of governing and way of thinking that makes it especially prone uh, to network effect and especially prone to, prone to monopolization and why in the US actually open standards are the most important thing. Right? So why you have to especially be careful uh, with the US markets dealing with open standards and not letting uh, monopolies happen in the first place. And it has to do with the size of the market and uh, a general ethos of uh, laissez-faire, meaning, you know, let it be, right? When you let it be, uh, things don't always turn out the way you think. Okay. So what are the perils of monopoly power? Uh, why should we be so concerned about this? Uh, and, uh, you know, again, it, there's, a, there's definitely a distinct way of thinking in Asia and Europe and uh, versus the uh, United States way of thinking. Uh, in Asia and Europe in particular, there are entire non-government organizations that understand these things and they keep an eye uh, to make sure these things don't happen. Uh, so the Monopoly is another funny word, right? So when when, when you uh, you know express this word to a uh, to a uh, non-economist, they automatically think, oh, it must be just one company that dominates the market, and it's like uh, impossible to get into that market. You know, they begin thinking, Im imagining uh, those old Western films where there is uh, some thug that you know, by fo forcibly takes over all the ranches and owns everything, uh, or the Monopoly game. They, they, they think one person wins in the end and owns just everything. But that's really not how monopoly power works uh, in, uh, in, in the real world. You don't have to really have to own everything all the time. But what happens is you, you can own enough uh, to control the market. Right? That, that is the biggest distinction between a healthy uh, 
uh, ecosystem and not, right? When there's a single vendor that uh, actually can control everybody else's decisions, right? Bob, and they have enough market power to, to dictate their way or the highway, right? So when that happens, uh, the, the losers are really the consumers uh, and the losers are also at the end of the day, anybody new that wants to enter the market. But at the end of the day, really what it comes down to is it's a bad outcome for consumers. Okay, so when you have monopoly power, uh, in the end, you, you get to uh, determine a higher pricing, uh, long, higher long-term pricing of something. Uh, you can also uh, control predatory pricing, meaning that you can at least temporarily, while you're establishing the monopoly, uh, uh, hold prices down below what it takes uh, for you to manufacture it. Uh, and that basically will drive out uh, all of the rest of the competition. Those that do not have monopoly power will be driven out of the market. Uh, there'll be fewer market choices in the end because not may, as many people will be able to enter uh, a market with monopoly power. Uh, usually there is also anti-competitive behaviors, right? So. Uh, Pricing behavior is one obvious one. Another, there's many other kind of such behaviors as well where that a monopolist can employ. For example, pressure on suppliers uh, and pressure on consumers uh, not to uh, not to go away from them and not to consider not to consider any any other competition. Uh, in the end of the uh, in the long term, this is unhealthy because it uh, it leads to uh, less innovation, less choices, less quality of service. Uh, and a very high-risk monoculture ecosystem. Even if this uh, monopolist was a, a person holding monopoly power, was very benevolent, right? If something were to change in that monopoly, um, basically it would put an entire ecosystem at risk, right? Because it, it's, it becomes essentially a single point of failure. So that's something I think as, as a computer scientist, we understand. So we want to avoid single points of failure and that's effectively what this uh, high-risk monoculture ecosystem becomes. So these are the things why we really need to pay attention uh, when we see these scenarios and we need to see what are the solutions. And of course, uh, in uh, the solutions that uh, most economists agree upon is uh, when there is network effect is this uh, open standard solution. So now let's dive into a little bit of what open standards really are. Right. So th this is another uh, funny wor word. Even even if you did understand the distinction between uh, de facto standards and open standards, what are open standards uh, and and what are the basically necessary preconditions to become uh, for something to be an effective open standard? That's something a lot of people also don't understand. Right. So uh, if you don't have a true open standard, it's actually just as dangerous, maybe even more dangerous. Uh, than a de facto standard. Um, so there are some basic things that need to be in place for something to be truly be an open standard. So an open standard, if you break down to it, it uh, are really these few components, right? So uh, it is the ability of corporations, which are essentially entities on their own, uh, Groups of people, so uh, groups of people uh, could be a group, a set of users, a set of interested users. Uh, so often, if you study uh, U.S. corporate dynamics, a funny thing that happens is that uh, a single individual shareholder doesn't actually have that much power. Right? So at the end of the day, power can reside in the corporate board of directors because every single shareholder is just they're doing their own little thing and their uh, their own little person and there's not much they can do as an individual but when these people band together and they come together they can actually be probably the most powerful force in the market right so uh, one of the participants of open standards could be groups of people that come together that have a common interest that are not tied in, a, in any direct financial way but uh, usually these are uh, groups of users groups of end users groups of consumers and of course uh, and individuals ought to also be able to participate uh, on their own. In fact, uh, back in the JCP, which I do consider uh, a, an open standard, I still do, uh, you know, that's what I did uh, for a number of years myself. Uh, I contributed just as an individual. I represented nobody. Uh, I represented simply myself, uh, and I contributed to uh, that open standard process. 
the second thing and the most valuable thing uh, and the thing that defines it and differentiates it from a non-open standard is the process. And the process needs to be well understood, well documented, uh, and non-discriminatory. Now, this is, I'm not talking about racial discrimination or uh, LGBT rights here. Uh, what this means is that all of these parties, uh, a company, uh, an individual, or a group of users can freely participate without hindrance. Uh, and this, this is guaranteed by the process itself. Okay. Uh, finally, there's a, a well understood set of artifacts, right? And then at the end of the day, the open standards need to produce something and it needs to produce uh, uh, enough, right? It, uh, so that the world can use it, right? So it, the output needs to be useful and, and repeatable. So any particular person can, should be able to take this output and produce something useful that is uh, that can be used by this entire ecosystem, whoever it may be in the world. All right. Um, so, like I said, the the process is the is the biggest deal here. Uh, so, this particular diagram, uh, I think Tanya will be very familiar with this. This is actually the uh, the Eclipse specific Eclipse Foundation specification process, the one that is being applied for uh, Jakarta E. But that's actually not the point, right? So, uh, the real point I wanted to give you uh, is to show you how. Uh, a, a process looks like, okay, uh, and what are the fundamentally key uh, important points uh, to having uh, the this sort the sort of open standards? If you look at the JCP documentation, it has something very very similar. If you look at, uh, for example, OSI, it has a very similar process. These all uh, look very similar, and they all have uh, the same fundamental components. There's always a proposal. Uh, so anybody can propose an idea or propose propose a standard. Uh, it there's always a review, uh, and these are all independent. So if you look at the U.S. system, the, there's uh, there's three branches of government, right? The executive branch, um, the legisl legislative branch, uh, and then the presidential, uh, or uh, rather the congressional branch, right? So uh, these part these in an open standard are also different bodies, right? So somebody when when somebody is reviewing something. Uh, there's supposed to be an independent view of what's going on. It's not supposed to be all the same people, right? So uh, in each of these things and each of these steps, there's always an open review process and anybody should be able to participate in this review, especially as an end user, you ought to be able to participate in the, in the review process. So you can review a proposal, you can review an execution plan, you can review the development process itself. Uh, the development process, hopefully these days, is agile. So there's going to be different milestones that are produced by uh, anything that is de developed under a, under a standard. Uh, these these things can also be reviewed in an, in an incremental basis. Finally, there will be a a, a, a version that is a big milestone, meaning a release. Okay, so that release ought to be uh, reviewed as well. And then finally, they're ratified and consumed to be put out there in the world uh, as something that everybody can take a look at. And this is just the process. There's many. There's other parts of uh, other parts of the picture as well in order for something to be counted as an open standard. But this is the heart of it. You, you need to have a well documented, well understood process that you have these basic components. And the most important uh, component is is a, a specific review process and a specific breakdown of when things occur and things can't just move along without cons without that word consensus right you so you need you need informed consensus through this review process before something can become uh something otherwise uh, it's no different than uh, a de facto standard here somebody just creating something and putting it out there whatever they feel like uh so that's not the case it, it, there has to be uh, this this a uh, part of it in it uh, in order to be for it to be counted as an open standard um, this, in general, is what an open standard produces, right? So we talked about uh, we talked about the players, right? Who who can be participants in an open standard? We talked about uh, the open standard process itself, and finally, let's talk a little bit about what is the final output, especially in terms of technology. What what are the things that are actually produced by a standards body? Um, so these are the what I call is is the specification triads, right? So the reason I, I call it a triad is because I put together I put together this uh, this diagram. I used to do a talk on on the JCP that's very very similar, uh, 
And what I uh, found out is, is these funny little triangles that are, that shows out all over the place. So these are triads of various kinds. So that's why I call it a triad, specification triads. So the three uh, basic artifacts are specification documents describing what is this specification is about and what are its features. Uh, then you need a compatibility test kit, something that is executable uh, uh, other than a document. You need something to be an executable set of tests that says, okay, if you have an implementation and it, the, you run these tests against it, uh, that these tests uh, should confirm that something is actually compatible. It meets it meets the uh, meets the standard, um, and the specification document and compatibility test kit uh, reinforce each other. Okay, uh, and finally, you have compatible implementations. So somebody comes up with with the the product the end product that conforms to the standard, conforms to the specification. Uh, in some cases, you can have a mandated reference implementation. For example, in the JCP, everything is supposed to have a reference implementation, at least one implementation uh, that is guaranteed to be in place, and it's always the same one. Um, in case of Jakarta E, you still need at least one implementation, but it's not does not necessarily need to be the same one. Okay, so you in in the in the Jakarta E world, you can have multiple implementations as long as there's per standards is at least one of those. Okay, we'll see how this works out in the end. Uh, this may become a situation where it's just a de facto reference implementation or not. Often that's what happens. Um, that's why it's sometimes a good idea just to say, hey, this is a reference implementation. It's well understood by everyone. Now, this is another weakness of open standards. You can always have partial implementations, things that don't quite pass the compatibility test kit. This, this is why you need uh, a governance regime and trademarks and uh, a legal uh, muscle behind open standards to avoid these things called partial implementations. And so this is just, again, very, very dangerous situation. And that's why I put the warning sign uh, on, on my diagram. And finally, you need governance, right? So it's it goes back to that review boxes, all of those three or four review boxes after, after each of them. You need somebody overseeing all of this, making sure that, hey, things are not uh, going wrong, right? It's not that people don't have good intentions. It's just that uh, it, it's difficult to guarantee anything if there is not an independent body Overseeing and making sure that the that the uh, best interests of the of the ecosystem are actually preserved at all points. Uh, you need stakeholders, right? So you need you need at least a dominant part of the market participating in open standards for them for them to be successful. And then finally, you need a community. You, you need a you need a set of people interested in this and uh, and interested in the mind share. So that's that's how that, that's another true value of an open standard. If nobody cares about it. There's no community around it. Nobody, nobody uh, sees its value. You know, it won't be successful. So you need the community around that as well. So there's a debate around uh, open standards versus open source, uh, especially since the 1970s or so. Certainly during the 1980s, there's been a, a debate that open somehow open source replaces open standards, and you don't need open standards anymore. The reality is very far from the truth, right? So open standards do provide uh, things like transparency. Uh, they do not uh, provide guarantees uh, on much more, um, the more important things uh, that we all talked about and hopefully by now you recognize. So there is no guarantee TCK uh, in, open, in open standards. There is no guaranteed transparency. There's no guaranteed interoperability. There's no guaranteed vendor neutrality. So. It's false, right? So open, open source is not a uh, replacement to open standards. However, it is an important complement. So if you really look, uh, it makes a lot of sense for open standards and open source to be working together. And in fact, this is how it works in practice. Right? So for every single uh, successful bit of software, most successful bits of software that stand the test of time, you'll find out that it is actually backed by one or more open standards. Uh, and open standards, in order for them to be successful, need to adopt open source. So the TCK needs to be open source. Impl at least one implementation, the reference implementation, should be open source. Uh, and that's how it, it, it you guarantee transparency right? That, at the end of the day. That, that's part of the fundamental reasons of why something needs to be an effective open standard. And there's no better way of guaranteeing transparency than open source. Open source is very, very good at that. Okay. So these are some of the usual complaints against 
open standards and I'm running a little short, short on time. So I'm going to breeze over some of this. Uh, so standards are slow. Uh, they're designed by committee, meaning you don't get to have your way. You know, it's basically what, whatever, whoever shows up and is the most vocal that ultimately dictates the decision. Uh, standards don't guarantee portability. Uh, yeah, that's true. They don't, they cannot uh, guarantee 100% portability. Don't have my feature that I value XYZ, right? Or my product has this feature XYZ that the standards doesn't have. Uh, standards don't innovate. It's just a, ben, a bunch of vendor experts and so on and so on and so on. There's a bunch of different complaints you can come up against uh, open standards. So um, hopefully my view on this is relatively cl clear from this slide. Right. So nothing in 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 uh, in the world is perfect, right? So you can take the best idea in the world and shoot a bunch of holes in it, right? But it doesn't mean that that idea doesn't have value. There's very things, very little things uh, that you cannot that do not have downsides. The real question is, is it worth it, right? So uh, these are some of the answers of some of the common ones that come up with uh, that that, uh, that that I see at least, right? So. Standards are slow. Yes, that's that's very true. It's standard uh, coming to consensus is um, is slower than uh, somebody just deciding to do whatever it is that they want without consulting anyone or talking to anyone or bothering to understand what the end user needs are. Uh, when you do these things, it takes time. Right? So reaching consensus takes time, and getting things right takes time. Right? So if you want to make mistakes, go very fast. If you want to do something. Right, you will probably take a little bit more time to do to do it, and you'll you'll bring along your entire village with it. Right, um, design by committee. Yes, this can happen. Okay, uh, it depends on again that openness, the desire, and and uh, uh, execution uh, for openness. If if it's not very open in practice, it can become designed by committee, but it's still better than. Uh, a totally benevolent dictatorship where there is absolutely no possibility of anyone providing any input. Uh, they don't guarantee portability, that's true, but it's still they get, uh, no standard in, at the end of the day can guarantee 100% portability. Right? That's virtually impossible. But it's still better than 100% lock-in where you really don't have any such guarantees whatsoever. Uh, at any point in time, a standard will not have all the features, right? Because at the end of the day, you're you're dealing with something that is consensus based, uh, and either way, you don't want a standard to have the kitchen sink. You don't want it to be bloated or complex. Uh, it'll, at the end of the day, uh, have a detrimental effect if, if a if a standard is complex or bloated. So you actually don't want all features in a standard. Uh, standards don't innovate. That's actually not really true, right? And so it hasn't been true if you look at most standards. Uh, they do uh, innovate in small ways, right? So uh, whenever there are, whenever this is an engineering activity and people are working together to come up with something new, inevitably there is there is innovation. Uh, but what there isn't is adventurism. So uh, you don't want uh, a lot of innovation uh, in open standards anyway. Okay, so you don't want to over standardize unproven or niche ideas. Uh, again, that devalues the fundamental. Uh, fundamental value proposition of a standard. It needs to be a stable core, right? It can be an unstable core that you cannot rely upon because there's all those bad ideas uh, that make it into the standard. Uh, and it's not just a bunch of vendor experts. It can be, uh, if you, uh, for example, as good as the ISO is, uh, good luck as an average scientist getting, getting attention from the ISO committee um, you better be uh, like some genius or, uh, you know, have some really big organization behind you. Okay, but it hasn't been true for Java open standards in a long time. And that's something we should strive to maintain as well. So it shouldn't just be a bunch of vendor experts that uh, uh, define direction and do whatever they want, right? The average Joe Schmo needs to be part of the part of the equation here. Uh, and we need to make, make ourselves, uh, get ourselves in there, make sure that we are heard, make sure people understand that they need to reach back uh, out to us, open uh, to our Josh uh to to uh, to listen to what we have to say. Right? So, at the end of, so at the end of the day, we can use the thing and we can advocate the thing. So all of this, hopefully, the subtext is we need you. 
right? So don't just go away. Yeah, don't, don't just uh, listen to my talk today and say, oh, nice talk. See you. Bye bye. Right. So at the end of the day, we need to, we need you to get involved. Right. So if nothing else, you need to be vocal uh, about uh, keeping an eye on things and and uh, making sure that bad things don't happen. So uh, Jakarta, in my opinion, is guaranteed. Uh, it, it has a lot of guarantees. People, the people that have formulated the work so far have come up with the process and the structure. They they have all these things in mind. They understand for the most part what these things are about. Uh, so you should definitely get involved here. Right? This is a this is a place where hopefully it's obvious that there is a network effect. Uh, if we don't do anything, what will emerge is probably at the end of the day a monopoly. Uh, so we need to make sure that that doesn't happen and the end the end winner is this open standard uh and there's no better way of guaranteeing that than you putting some skin in the game so i already alluded to that uh dynamic of individual voices versus collective voices right and the importance of why collective voices matter so uh in in the jakarta e space you are i i would say very lucky that there is such a thing that exists already uh, and you can make yourself uh, part of it, right? And that is the Jakarta e ambassadors. Take a look at what we do and see if it makes sense for you. Uh, now, finally, I want to uh, throw a little bit of a monkey wrench in my uh, so far about 50 minute uh, conversation. Standards are a great thing. Don't get me wrong. Right? So uh, I've, we've already talked about why uh, open standards uh, need to be in place and why we all need to uh, work hard uh, to ensure that it succeeds, and it does not succeed on its own. It's kind of like democracy. Uh, if you don't care about it, uh, you know, ultimately it turns into uh, fascism or or some something like that. That is no longer a democratic system. It looks democratic on the surface, but it's not. So you have to work hard in making sure open standards succeed and continue to succeed. But it can't be all uh, a silver bullet to everything, right? So let's let's explore some of the reasons why that's not the case. So at any point in time, uh, not everything should be standardized. So uh, in particular, there should be extensions to the open standard that expand frontiers in unexpected ways, right? So uh, because standards cannot innovate themselves or shouldn't be, something else needs to innovate. And typically, the, the best way to do that is extensions based on open, uh, proven open standards. And then standards can always uh, adopt common, mature, and proven ideas right, from these sets of ecosystems. And this is why you can't have uh, open standards only. There needs to be other players uh, besides open standards, where open standards are really the dominant player. We talked about uh, before what it means to be a monopoly. Monopoly doesn't mean you own everything. It means that you're just important enough. Right? So in this case, open standards can be just important enough uh, and still allow for uh, other players to innovate. Uh, so that those can turn can downstream turn into open standards. Uh, standards can safeguard against monopolies, but one other thing that it does not uh, does not safeguard against is uh, is oligopolies. So when there is uh, there is an open standard, but there's too few people that control it, right? And uh, it, this is again why users uh, and user communities are important, right? So. Uh, and why uh, players outside of the uh, open standards are sometimes important to serve as counterbalances uh, against this uh, oligarchy situation. Right? So, uh, and oligarchies don't are not always uh, malicious, right? They just kind of happen because uh, you know there's a small set of players that work with each other very closely, and they're kind of buddies, and they don't want to uh, sort of go against each other. So it's sort of complacent collusion, right? It's not something uh, that these people are evil. It's just that, you know, they've gone, they've come to be too comfortable with each other. And so th this is another reason why you need um, sort of things like user communities and things outside the standard. Um, and there, there can be peaceful coexistence, absolutely, right? So uh, this is why you need these things and why they should be treated as a valuable part of the standards ecosystem, a very valuable extension of it. Uh, you need to uh, basically value these things, but at the end of the day, don't value them too much, right? So at the end of the day, if you value them too much, they'll probably be then your next dictator. 
Uh, so uh, you need to always maintain counter rights. But the important thing should always be open standards. But there's, there's, there needs to be an ecosystem around that as well, where innovation happens uh, and uh, con competitive uh, counter rights exist. Uh, at the end of the day, this is all about choice, right? It's a fundamental idea that uh, you need a healthy amount of choices uh, as a consumer. So those things uh, need to be in place for you. But at the end of the day, if there's one message I would like to leave you with you uh, uh, this fine uh, morning, at least a morning for me so far, uh, is you, the empowered user, right? So you ultimately decide all of this. You're in the driving seat. Uh, if you decide to be an em empowered user, uh, you can make all the difference in the world. Uh, if you just decide to do nothing and let somebody make all the decisions, well, you know, you won't wind up with good good outcomes. So this is why you need uh, to be an empowered user and, and uh, see the value in these things and get involved in them and hopefully articulate the value of these things to other people as well. So Reza, I have a question from Sergey. Um, yeah. Can standards be changed? And if so, how often? Uh, standards should absolutely be changed. Um, standards, uh, it's, a, it's, it's an important balance to maintain uh, health and uh, long-term maintainability in terms of a, a standard. So an open standard cannot be like a, like a open source product. Right? You can't, you, because there is a, a large ecosystem that depends on open standard and multiple people need to reach consensus and adopt the standard, it can't be so fast that nobody can keep up with it. Right. So it needs to be deliberately a little bit slower uh, than its maximum velocity. Right. So uh, I don't know what the right answer is in terms of Jakarta E. My sense is no more than one one release a year. I probably a, a release a year for Jakarta E is a healthy pace, healthy enough pace. Anything more than that, I I, I really suspect it's too much. Um, maybe uh, the answer is that this quarterly uh, non LTS releases and really one. This one long-term support release uh, for uh, for Jakarta E, uh, and in fact, I I, I had the same opinion about uh, about Java SC as well. I, I believe the current pace that things are in is probably unsustainable. Uh, you know that's why you see a bunch of people just staying on Java SC eight. Any other questions? This is the end of my presentation. Either way, by the way. Oh. So um, many people are just uh, uh, thanking and, and following the talk. Uh, let me see. There is a ask a question here. OK, so I have from uh, Martin uh, Chavez. So in order to get transparency and have a truly impact on the market, it is recommended to use the, uh, the, judge, stand the, yeah, the judge standards, right? Open standards. So yes, in order to guarantee transparency, you need those elements, right? You need uh, people to be able to participate. Uh, in particular, I would say uh, groups of users, so Java user groups, absolutely. Uh, the, ja the Jakarta E ambassadors is another way of participating as a group. You need to be able to have individuals that, want, that are able to participate, even if they don't want to be part of any other group. They themselves should be able to participate. Companies need, need to be able to participate. Uh, in an equal fashion, you need that open process, open, well-defined process that lends itself to all of these things and lends itself to external review. Uh, you need important enough artifacts. So again, those uh, the specification documents, uh, uh, the TCK and the compatible implementations. So it's a bunch of different things uh, in order for to that need to be in place that in order to make for all of this to happen. Absolutely. Anything else from the audience? You're welcome, Martin. OK, a lot of thanks. And um, just so you know, um, here on the Crowdcast, even, um, I mean, I, I know you know where to contact um, and how to contact Reza. Uh, you can always go to um, Jakarta e Ambassadors. Um, you can always also uh, have a question posted here on, on this uh, Crowdcast uh, platform and, and uh, we can get back to you later. But I also want to uh, reemphasize uh, what uh, uh, Reza was communicating. We need you to get involved. 
and uh, uh, please feel free to approach us if, if you have any concerns in how to do that. Uh, and just a reminder for everyone that there is a big discussion going on uh, between uh, collaboration between MicroProfile and Jakarta E. Um, we extended you the invite. Uh, um, uh, actually, Amelia from uh, uh, who is very, very involved in both of communities, but particularly MicroProfile extended invite to the whole Jakarta E community. Uh, on Tuesdays, there are MicroProfile hangouts where uh, some of these uh, topics will be discussed. So please. Um, uh, participate and, and uh, um, you know, uh, let's make open standards in, in, in Java E um, uh, strong and very much relevant. So I think that's everything from us. We're two minutes over time. Uh, please look for uh, look for another um, tech talk um, and any way to reach out and, and, and get involved. Okay. Uh, All right, thank I'll you, Dania. I, I appreciate your time, and uh, hopefully uh, this was useful. Oh, very useful. Thank you so much, Reza. Okay, thanks, everyone, and uh, we'll be in touch. Bye.